So most people uh, recognize that the Bush-Gore presidency was decided by uh, electoral college versus the person who won the popular vote. Um, and the same thing has happened most recently in the Trump-Clinton uh, race where Clinton had three million votes more than, um, than Trump did in the election, but he, but he won more electoral votes. Uh, this has also happened three other times in our um, history, so it's not just this recent past. The Electoral College is part of the U.S. Constitution. Some people have said, well, pass a constitutional amendment to abolish the Electoral College, but you're going for what you would consider a simpler route, and that is an interstate compact. Tell us about what, what's it called and what does it do? So the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact an interstate compact being um, the way that you get to use your Florida driver's license when you go to California, for example, or we share water rights with Georgia. So there's plenty of interstate compacts. They're perfectly legal as long as they don't infringe on federal uh, areas of rule. Um, in, the, in the Constitution, it's very clear that uh, elections, particularly electing the president, is a state's rights issue. And so the law that uh, governs the electors basically says that any state legislature can determine how their electors vote. And in the very beginning of our constitutional, of our country, the winner-take-all system that we have currently was not in use. And when you say winner-take-all, you mean that if someone, if someone gets 50% plus one in Florida, they get all of the electors in Florida. That's correct. <laughs> Excuse me. Even, even though in this last election, Trump only won by less than 1% of the vote, 113,000 votes. So, and that's true in every state except two. I've heard the argument that says, well, if the, essentially the popular vote determines who is president, that means that only a f handful of very large states will be the ones who determine who the president are, who the president is, and the rest of the states, it doesn't matter. What's your uh, argument against that argument? So currently, uh, 11 or 12 states are swing states, and so 90% of all candidate uh, forums and, and advertising happens in those 13 states. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it's Ohio had something like 70% of all um, campaign events and dollars spent there, trying to influence their uh, their election. So the big, so the argument that X number of states would control the election is already an argument for going in the opposite direction. Because right now, California with 55 electors basically saw one candidate visit in the last election. And there are some other arguments, though, too. What are they? So the other arguments are that um, the smaller states have a disproportionate uh, number of, uh, or an outweighed value to their electors. So Wyoming has a small population, and they have four electors. So they basically have one elector per 150,000 people. Whereas in Florida, with our 20 million people and 29 electors, we have basically one elector for 725,000 electors. So, so you could add up um, nine states with 10 million uh, people population, and they have the same 29 electors that Florida has with twice that population. And then there's even a third argument that um, you know, cities will outweigh rural areas, and that's not true either. 15% of our population lives in cities, 15% lives in the rural areas. The cities vote about 63%, uh, Democrat, not 100%. The, the rural areas vote 60%, Republican, not 100%. And the rest, is 50% of the population, is actually uh, in the suburbs, and they they vote 50-50. That's why there's so much, uh, you know, give and take with the soccer moms and, you know, other constituencies from election to election. 
And what about a state, rather than having a winner-take-all system, there, there are a couple of states that do this already, but may, are there more states that are thinking about proportioning their electors by district? So if you did proportioning, which is not, not what those other two states do, uh, this t going back and looking at elections, which of course is a you know, zero-sum game because it would have been, um, uh, campaigning would have been done differently, but um, you essentially would have had no winner with 270 electors, which is the majority that you need. And the reason for that is that, you know, you'd have some smaller um, uh, candidates scamming off a couple of votes here and there, and so you'd have, you know, 262 to 263 to 7 or something. So you, so you have a real problem with that, with proportioning. Uh, what the two other states do is districting, and again, you have, if you did districting and you went back, you, you would have a really hard time. Um, you know, it wouldn't make any difference. In Florida, the, the way it would work would be, just take the, the last election. Um, so we have uh, 29 electors, two of which are based on our overall state uh, value. So those two electors would go to the whoever took the popular vote in Florida. Um, and if you looked at who won which districts, uh, Clinton would have taken um, 13 and Trump would have taken 14 and because he won by 113,000 votes, he would have got those other two. So it would have been 16 to 13. 16 to 13 rather than all 29 going to one candidate right. because the election was so close. Yes. Well, those were my only questions. Uh, what If people are interested in getting involved, how, what can they do? Yeah, so like I said, this is a legislative issue. It's not something that we can go out and have people sign a petition and put it on the amendment, you know, as a constitutional amendment. So there will be bills. It's early in the, um, uh, in the legislative session right now. It hasn't started yet. So both bills have been, or this, the same bill, it's exactly the same bill in every state that's, again, part of the interstate compact, um, will be filed for the third year in a row, both in the House and the Senate. And uh, you can go to uh, LWV, FL, Legal Women Voters Florida, dot org slash issues slash NPV and sign up for our ongoing newsletter and we'll post the new bill uh, numbers when they're available. And uh, tomorrow at the uh, Children's Board in Tampa, I'll be speaking for an hour. Well, I won't speak for the whole hour, but I'll do a full presentation with slideshow and then open up to uh, questions from the audience. And that's sponsored by the League of Women Voters Hillsboro. Um, and that's in registration at 5.30 and uh, start time is at 6. We also have um, an, another event March 7th in St. Pete and one in uh, Pasco coming up um, April 24th. And um, March 13th, in Orlando, we actually have um, a rock star from uh, the University of Illinois who did uh, his thesis on the NPV, and, and he will be uh, available there. So uh, if you get a hold of, of anybody at the League of Women Voters uh, in any of those uh, chapters, we'll be able to give you further information. Well, great. Thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure.